So this may be the most important tutorial I ever make on this channel. And I say this because this problem is not specific or unique to GameMaker. In fact, it shows up in nearly every engine or framework used to create games. And it's this idea of treating the player object and the character object as the same object. So many projects I've worked on, the player object is the same as the character controller. They are used interchangeably. But I think there's actually a huge distinction that should be made between these two objects. Objects. I mean, if we think about it conceptually, it makes sense. The character object is the actor in virtual world space interacting with other gameplay elements, whereas the player object should be an abstract controller that represents the human that is actually playing the game. Now, why does this distinction matter? Well, there's actually a whole list of benefits that we get when we treat these two objects separately, and there's a whole list of problems that we can avoid if we separate these objects. So I actually want to go over my code implementation for this solution and showcase why I think every developer should be decoupling their player and character objects from each other and all of the benefits that we get from this implementation. If you have a project on hand, go ahead and open it up and I want you to go into your player object. For me, it's the character object because, well, that's the point of this video, but I want you to go into what you consider your player object. And in the step event, let's add this piece of code. If keyboard check pressed, VK backspace, instance destroy. Now let's press backspace. So if your game crashed right now, this is gonna be the first problem with coupling our player and character objects. Let's do another. So wherever it is that you are spawning your player instance, I want you to go ahead and spawn another player instance. For me, I'm gonna come into our room. I'm going to just duplicate our spawn point and run the project. Now, are you able to move around your players? Does your game crash having two player objects? If so, then this would be yet another problem. Now let's go ahead and spawn an enemy or an NPC. So however you would do this in your your project but in mine i'm going to go ahead and copy the spawn point i'll go ahead and change this from a hero spawn to an enemy spawn now my question to you is is this enemy or npc object the same as your player object or do they at least inherit from a shared root class if not then this is another problem with tightly coupling your two objects together because now you have to manage another object definition in this project the object definition between these two objects is shared so if i press p to swap player, suddenly now I'm able to move around the snake. And if I press P again, I have just swapped possession over to the player objects. Now, is this something that you feel like you would be able to easily implement? If not, then this is an example of limited functionality that arises as the result of tightly coupling our player and character objects. If I asked you a question, do a global search through your project for if instance exists of OBJ player. This is a line of code that I guarantee you all of us have written hundreds of times. But if I do a global search for this on my project, you'll notice that this doesn't actually exist. I can change this to be character, right? Because while well, in my project, the character object is separated. Well, if I do a search for this, you'll also notice that there are zero results. So if you feel like you find yourself writing this statement, you know, if instance exists of OBJ player, then do all this stuff. What you've experienced is the results of a fragile relationship between your game systems. In addition to a fragile system, we don't have a very scalable system. Let's say I asked you to implement character statistics into your project that kept track of things like number of footsteps taken or the total amount of damage taken. And then I also asked you to implement player statistics into your project that kept track of things like login credentials or total playtime hours. Could you do these things easily? What about serializing that data for network requests or saving and loading requests? These types of features and tasks suddenly become much easier when your player and character are no longer one object. And finally, if our player and character are the same object, once again, we are creating confusion in our project architecture. Why is the scene actor handling player input management? Why is the scene actor handling game mode team assignment? Why why is the scene actor handling metadata management? All of these are beyond the scope of the character object. The character object should just move around and swing the sword. That's it. Any sort of metadata or meta logic handling should be handled at a higher level of abstraction by the player object. 
So this kind of begs the question as to, well, what is a player? What is the player object? If the player object isn't the actor on the screen, we have to have some sort of formal definition for how we can think of what a player object is. It's better to think of the player object as an abstract controller, but another layer removed from that even, we can think of the player really as an entry point into our application. The player is the human sitting behind the keyboard putting input that is then fed into the game project. And we can think of the character as the output of the application. The player takes input and feeds it into the game and the character is moved or acts and that generates the output that we see. So when we tightly couple our input and our output by tying them to the same object, we are creating a very fragile system. So hopefully this explains the pros and cons to this structure. Let's go ahead and jump into some code and I'm gonna show you how to make a few very easy adjustments to your project to implement the flexibility and benefits of this whole idea. So if you have a player object in your project, the first thing we're going to want to do is rename this to obj character. Now, once we think of our player object as our character, the next step is to actually implement the abstract player object. So I'm gonna create a new object, call it obj player, and I'm going to set it to be persistent. As I mentioned, this is an abstract controller. So the presence of the player should be persistent throughout the entirety of the project. It doesn't matter if we are on the title menu or the ending credits, the player is present for the entirety of the game's runtime. So setting the player as a persistent object makes sense for this goal. So the player is created. I'm gonna go ahead and add a create event. So here we have an empty player object. As I mentioned previously, the player object is going to be responsible for tracking and managing any character objects associated to it. So in order to do this, I'm gonna start by adding a new region Region, and I'm going to call it character. First, I'm going to declare a new private section because this object does not have a private section already declared. But now inside of our character region, I'm going to go ahead and define a new sub region inside of our private block called character. And now I will move into this private character block. So I know that I'm going to be keeping track of a character instance and I have a character private section. So I'm going to go ahead and create a new member called instance and I will set this to undefined. Now I'm going to create a new public method and I'm going to call it character creates. This is going to be a method. I essentially want this to just be a wrapper function for our instance create depth or instance create layer. So I essentially want this method to act in the same way. Because of this, the first couple parameters will be an X and a Y position. Character is instance create depth of X, Y, zero OBJ character. So I've created this character object. Now I need to assign it to our private reference character instance is character. And then I'm going to return the character back to the user. But the character itself is still unaware of the player that is managing it. So we still need to finish the relationship establishment between the character and the player. I'm going to add another parameter into this character create, and I'm going to call it config and default this to an empty struct. I have two videos covering the topic of the config struct. So if you're interested to learn more about that topic, definitely check out those videos. And so now that the config struct is declared, I want to go ahead and pass that config struct into our instance create depth or instance create layer function. So this means that anything we pass into our character create method and into this config struct will be assigned to our obj character in the pre-create event. This is great because now this allows us to pass in external modifiers to the character object. And it's also great because it allows us to define some enforced parameters, which we will do in this case. Config of player is equal to self. So now because of this line, the character has a reference to the player. And because of this line, the player has a reference to the character. So we have established a link in both directions, creating that association between these two objects. I guess in addition to creating the character, maybe we want to do a character destroy method as well. So the first thing we'll wanna do is make sure that our character reference is not undefined. And we should also make sure that this instance exists. Instance destroy character instance. 
and then I want to wipe the reference. So I will set character instance is undefined. So this would be a basic implementation for doing character destroy, which will first check that the reference is valid, and then we'll do the destruction and wipe the reference. Okay, so we could continue to build out a whole set of methods to help us manage this character instance. But for now, I'm gonna stop here. The next thing what we need to do is go into our character object and add some new members and methods into our character object. Okay, so I have a character object on the right side. Your character Character object will probably have a bunch of code already written in it. In the character object, I'm going to add a new region. I'm going to call it player. And in my example, I don't have a private region declared already. So I will declare a new private region. And now I will declare a player region inside of our private struct with private player. I will store a reference to our instance. Now, in this case, because the player instance might be coming down through our config struct over here on the left side, so we should actually set this up to support fetching that member if it has been declared. Self of player. And if that is undefined, then we will just default to undefined. So if our self has a player member declared, then we will store it in our instance here. And because we are storing that player instance here in our private section, I don't want to have it tracked in our public section. So I will just say variable struct remove of self player. So now this will remove the member from the public section of the character, and we will only track it through the private section. Let's go ahead and declare a public region, and I will say player gets, and this will just return private of player instance. Now player exists. This is a useful one to have. Return player instance is not undefined, and instance exists of player instance. And just for our example, let's go ahead and add another method called player remove. First, we will check if player exists. Then we will say player instance is equal to undefined. Also say player instance character remove. Now this is a method that doesn't exist. So let's come over here and say character remove. This will just say character instance equals undefined. Great, so we've created that method abstraction. Now I can come into character destroy and I will just replace this line of code here with character remove. I'm gonna go ahead and use this new method we created in our character destroy method and know that if I ever have to add anything else, I can very quickly add it here and I'm not having to update this code anywhere else. Okay, so I have a character create remove destroy method on the left and now we've said, well, if we remove the player from the character, we first check that that player exists. We call character remove, so we remove ourselves from the player reference and then we remove the player from the character reference. Okay, great. So this is just kind of setting up the support between the two systems, right? This is most of what needs to be done when establishing the link between these two objects. Now keep in mind that the only way that this character object gets a reference to the player object is if we use this method to create it. So wherever you're creating your character object, you need to change that. Make sure that you are calling this method. Now, if you're creating your character object by putting it in the room, then all you need to do is just add a room start event to your player object and call this character create method in there. Now, ideally you would have some sort of spawn points or spawn system or spawn controller that would help manage these types of behaviors. But if you don't have that implemented, all you would have to do is just call character create on your room start event. So just make sure that you're calling this method because if you don't call this method, then your character is never going to have any sort of awareness of the player that needs to control it. The other thing we need to do is make sure that these player objects exist. So the best way to do this is to add this into your game controller. So if I open up my game controller here and I come into my state region, we can expand and take a look at our state machine. And you'll see that I have a state here called game state create controllers. In this state is where I create the player instances. So however you want to create the player instances is going to be up to you. But I recommend just adding it into your game controller. So if you have a very simple game controller, then we could just do something very simply, which is instance create depth 000 obj player. And if we have multiple players, then we could duplicate this a few times. We could add a config struct here that says something like port is, you know, zero for this one, one for this one, and three for this one, right? So, you know, we want each of these players to be associated to a port. So here I create four players. I pass in a config struct. I define the port index there. And then I would do the assignment inside of the player object as to the port, right? So I could open up our player object here. I could say port. This would be used for handling input control. I'd say private port with private of ports index is self of ports 
Otherwise, we will default it to zero. And then I will remove this variable struct remove from the public scope so that it is only accessible through the private. So here I could create a public method, port git, and return the port index. So normally somewhere in your code inside of your step event, you have some code that's gonna look like this. You know, if keyboard check BK left, then we do some sort of movement. Let's just say we move our X position by minus one. So this is fine, but we are checking for input at a global level here. So this doesn't allow us to distinguish input on very specific player objects. Let's say I have two players in a scene. One person is using the keyboard and the other person is using a gamepad. Then I need to make sure that the characters that belong to those players are listening for input that's associated to those players. So I can't do global keyboard checks like this because it's listening at the global level and will lose that player specific reference. So really what I should do is I'm going to get rid of these methods, create a new region called input, and I'm just going to create a set of public methods here. And so for every keyboard check pressed event I have, so in the example I just showed, it was moving to the left, I need to create a new method. And this is going to be input left down, input left pressed and input left released. So the idea here is that I'm simulating what GameMaker provides us when they say keyboard check, keyboard check pressed, and keyboard check released. But instead of checking at the global level, I'm going to create a new set of local methods that will encapsulate this checking behavior. So inside of this method, I don't want to just say return keyboard check BK left, because then we're right back where we started. What I need to do is I need to check for the player instances input and make sure that that is what is returning. If player exists, I want to return player instance input left down or return false. So what I'm going to do is I'm now going to create another set of methods on the player called input left down input left pressed and input left released. So now when I say character input left down, I will check to see if we have a player. And if we do, we're just going to call input left down on that player object. So then that will come over to here. And this is where I want to do the keyboard check. For now, I will just leave it as keyboard check VK left. But realistically, what you want to do is then replace this with a proper input system that will differentiate between input devices associated to the player. So a good example of this would be to use the gamepad functions, which we could say return gamepad button check. We need a device. So for this, we will say port index. We'll say GP pad L. So return left is going to be if we're pressing the left D pad and on the port index that we've assigned to this player. So I could go ahead and copy this and change this to check released, check pressed. And now inside of our character, I'm going to go ahead and copy this for each of these. And this will be input left pressed and input left released. So what we're doing is we're introducing several layers of abstraction to handle our input because of the new association we've created between our player and character. The reason we want to do this is because the character doesn't know what type of input device the player is using. In fact, the character doesn't care about it. The character just wants to know, should I move left? Should I move right? Should I attack? Should I jump? And so instead of having the character try to be aware of differentiating between different input device keys, we just defer that that logic to the player object. And if we don't have a player object, then there's no input coming through. So we just say there's no input, it's false. But then if there is a player object, well, we just get the player objects check and the player object can be responsible for managing the different types of input devices. Okay, so that's pretty much it. Now, there's so much more we could talk about on this topic, but these are the two main parts, establishing the relationship between the two objects and deferring logic from the character to the player. And the more that we can do that, the more flexibility we get with our character. So if you guys have any questions about this topic, please leave them in the comments down below. But I hope that this gets you thinking a little bit differently about what a player is and what a character is and what their relationship should be. Let me know what you think and I'll see you in the next video.